Well, welcome back. This is the second session dealing with pulmonary gas exchange. And in the first, you may remember, we looked at the cascade, the oxygen cascade from the air to the mitochondria. And we looked at three of the four causes of hypoxemia. That is hypoventilation, diffusion limitation, and shunt. Today, we're going to look at the fourth cause ventilation perfusion inequality. And the first question you might well ask is why do you devote a whole session to this topic of ventilation perfusion inequality? And there are three reasons for this. One is that it is by far the commonest cause of impaired gas exchange in lung disease. So it's important that we understand what's going on. The second is that it's the most difficult to understand. And the third is that there are lots of misconceptions out there about ventilation perfusion inequality. So that's the reason why we're going to concentrate on it over the next uh, half an hour or so. Now, why, what's so special about the ventilation perfusion ratio? Why is that ratio so important? And this image, indicates that the reason why it's so important is that it determines the concentration of any gases in the alveolar gas and the effluent capillary blood in the lung. In other words, the ventilation perfusion ratio determines the gas exchange in any one lung unit. Now, you may say, well, that doesn't look intuitively obvious to me. Why should that ratio do that? And here's a model that I think may help. Here we have a, a, a glass model, if you like, of a gas exchanging unit. And we're simulating ventilation by pouring powdered dye from a beaker here into what's supposed to look like an airway. And then we have the alveolar gas compartment down here with the, the water being pumped through here, simulating the blood flow. And uh, we get uh, a certain concentration of the dye here. And of course, the effluent blood has the same concentration as the alveolar gas. And incidentally, in the whole of this session, we're going to be assuming that the, there is no difference between the partial pressures and the, in the alveolar gas and the end capillary blood. In other words, we're assuming there's no diffusion limitation, and that's certainly a reasonable assumption for uh, the topic we're dealing with here. And the question we're asking is, what determines the concentration of dye in this alveolar gas compartment and the effluent blood? Now, you can see intuitively that if you fix the rate at which you pump the water through, then the faster you pour in the dye, the higher the concentration under steady state conditions. Again, we can see intuitively that if we fix the rate at which we pour in the dye and we, for example, increase the flow of water, then the concentration of dye here is going to be reduced. What is not so intuitive, perhaps, is that if we pour the dye in at V grams per minute, pump the water through at Q liters per minute, the concentration in the alveolar gas and the effluent blood is V over Q grams per liter. In other words, it's the ratio of the ventilation to the blood flow that determines the concentration of the dye. And of course, not only the concentration of the gases, but their partial pressures, and uh, that's why the ventilation perfusion ratio is such a critical variable. Now let's in, look in some detail at what happens if we change the ventilation perfusion ratio of a lung unit. And this uh, image looks pretty daunting at first, but it's not really. Uh, we can go through, the, through it slowly and you'll soon see that it, it all makes good sense. First of all, look at this first, this first lung unit here marked A. This is a lung unit with a normal ventilation perfusion ratio. Now, of course, we know that the inspired PO2 is 150. Uh, the PCO2 in the inspired air we can neglect. It's so small that we can neglect it. 
And we know by now that the net result in a lung which is, or a lung unit which is normally ventilated and perfused is to give us a PO2 in the alveolar gas of 100 and a PCO2 of 40. The partial pressures are of the mixed venous blood entering the lung are a PO2 of 40 and a PCO2 of 45. And so we're now familiar, I think, pretty much with all these numbers on this, uh, in this normal unit. And actually, I like to remember them. They're not particularly difficult to remember. And uh, this tells us what happens under normal conditions. And over here, we've got a, a dot on a line indicating normal gas exchange. Now suppose that we gradually reduce the ratio of ventilation to blood flow. We reduce the ventilation perfusion ratio. And the easiest way to do this is to gradually obstruct the airway. And as we obstruct the airway, you can see that less ventilation will come in, but the blood flow is still removing oxygen and, and adding CO2. And I think anyone could see intuitively that that's going to cause the PO2 to fall and the PCO to rise as we reduce the ventilation. Now, it turns out to be extremely difficult to calculate what happens to the PO2 and the PCO2 as we gradually decrease the ventilation perfusion ratio. And I don't want to go into the details of this, but the reason is that it depends on the nonlinear oxygen and CO2 dissociation curves and their interaction. So it's a complicated process. But we can see what happens ultimately if we reduce the ventilation perfusion ratio to zero. In other words, if we completely obstruct the airway and there's no ventilation at all, then of course the partial pressures in the alveolar gas and the effluent blood are going to be the same as the inflowing mixed venous blood. So the PO2 will be 40 and the PCO2 will be 45. Now you may say, well, I don't know why you call that gas exchange because there's no gas exchange there. Well, that's true. But the point is that we can approach as closely as we please to, this, to this, these levels here by gradually reducing the ventilation perfusion ratio. And although we can't work out what's happening en route, we can see the final result as shown here. And in this line below here called the ventilation perfusion ratio line, we're showing the effects of decreasing the ventilation perfusion ratio, and eventually we end up at the composition of mixed venous blood. And the artist has put a uh, right ventricle there to indicate the mixed venous blood. Okay, so that's decreasing the ventilation perfusion ratio. What happens as we gradually increase the ratio? Well, again, the simplest way of doing that is to gradually obstruct the blood flow coming into this lung unit. As we gradually obstruct the blood flow, we're going to be removing less oxygen and adding less CO2. And so I think intuitively we can see that the PO2 is going to rise and the PCO2 is going to fall as we increase the ventilation perfusion ratio. Now again, it's very complicated to work out exactly what happens as we gradually increase the ratio, but again, we can see easily what happens when the ventilation perfusion ratio is infinitely high, that is to say, when there's no blood flow at all. Now we have the composition of the inspired air, because of course no oxygen is being taken up and no CO2 is being added, but ventilation is still there. Again, you may say, well, I wouldn't regard that as pulmonary gas exchange, but again, the point is that we can approach as closely as we wish to this situation by moving along this line, and of course, ultimately, we'll get to these values here. So this line is showing us all the possible changes as we go from the normal situation to decreasing the ventilation perfusion ratio to zero, and increasing this ventilation perfusion ratio to an infinitely high value when the blood flow is zero. Now we can show the same information on a diagram. And this is on the next image. And as you can see, it's a diagram that has PCO2 on the vertical axis here and PO2 on the horizontal axis.
and it's often called an oxygen carbon dioxide diagram. It's a very useful way of depicting the changes in gas exchange. And this is exactly the same line as we saw in the last image, and these are exactly the same lung units. First, we've got the normal lung unit here, that is with a normal ventilation perfusion ratio, and it's got a PO2 of about 100 and a PCO2 of about 40, okay? And then as you gradually decrease the ventilation perfusion ratio, you end up with a PO2 of about 40, and a PCO2 of about 45. As you gradually increase the ventilation perfusion ratio, you end up eventually with a PO2 of 150 and a PCO2 of zero. Now when you come to think of it, about it, this ventilation perfusion ratio line is very powerful. It's depicting all possible gas exchange in lung units when a lung is supplied by normal mixed venous blood and is inspiring air. In other words, it would be impossible for this lung to have a PO2 of, say, 60 and a PCO2 of 20. It would be impossible. It couldn't exist. So this line is showing us all possible compositions of PO2 and PCO2 in lung units for a normal mixed venous blood and a normal inspired air. And by the way, notice that we're assuming here that changes in this single lung unit that we're looking at are not affecting the composition of mixed venous blood. And that's okay. We're looking at a big lung here and we're looking at a single lung unit and it's not going to, the, the gas exchange in that is not going to affect the mixed venous blood in any measurable way. So this is a very powerful line, this ventilation perfusion ratio line, and I'm going to show you now how this can affect gas exchange in a lung. And what we're going to be talking about now is the normal upright human lung. Now I should emphasize that ventilation perfusion inequality is not a serious problem in the normal lung. But the fact is that the normal lung is so arranged that there is a gradient of ventilation perfusion ratio down the lung and it allows us to see very clearly the effects of the ventilation perfusion ratio on regional gas exchange. So first, let me show you the distributions of ventilation and blood flow in the normal upright human lung. Now we've already dealt with blood flow and you recall that the blood flow at the bottom of the lung here is much higher than the blood flow at the top. In fact, the top of the lung is barely perfused with blood under normal resting conditions. We haven't yet dealt with the distribution of ventilation. We will in a subsequent uh, session. But ventilation also decreases as we go up the lung. It doesn't decrease as rapidly as does blood flow, but it still decreases. And incidentally, the uneven distribution of blood flow, you recall, is caused by gravity. It's actually caused by the hydrostatic uh, gradient of pressures in the lung uh, that's responsible for the distribution of blood flow. And interestingly enough, the uneven distribution of ventilation is also caused by gravity, but in this case, it's the distortion of the lung by its own weight. And we'll be talking about that in a later session. But the point here is that both ventilation and blood flow change in this way. And therefore, if we take the ratio of ventilation to blood flow, this is going to be low at the bottom of the lung. If you like, that's mainly because the blood flow is so high there. So the ventilation perfusion ratio is low at the bottom of the lung, increases as we go up the lung, and is high at the top of the lung. And if you like, you can say, well, that's because the blood flow is so low at the top of the lung. So here's the ventilation perfusion ratio, and we can track it as we go from the top of the lung to the bottom of the lung. And actually, this slide shows a number of points on this line, and these were used many years ago when we were measuring the ventilation perfusion ratio, or measuring the distribution of blood flow and ventilation, and therefore uh, ca calculating the ventilation perfusion ratio. So now let's look at what happens at each of these levels in the lung as the ventilation perfusion ratio changes. And this is shown here. Here we've got the 
upright lung, upright human lung, with a series of imaginary slices, nine imaginary slices. And each of these has a different ventilation perfusion ratio. The top of the lung, as we just saw, has a very high ventilation perfusion ratio, and therefore it's located towards the end of this ventilation perfusion ratio line. As we go down the lung, the ventilation perfusion ratio decreases, and at the bottom of the lung, the ratio is relatively low, and therefore it's indicated by a point here. And so you can easily see from this that we're going to predict differences of regional gas exchange. For example, the PO2 at the top of the lung is going to be, what, 130 or so, uh, and the PCO2 is going to be 30 or something like that. At the bottom of the lung, the PO2 is going to be closer to 90, say, and the PCO2 is going to be almost 45. So we can see from a diagram like this that there are going to be regional differences in gas exchange. And these are actually shown in this image here. Now, we've only shown the top and the topmost and bottommost slices because we could put in all the other numbers, but it would look very messy, and that's not the point. And incidentally, no one's claiming that these numbers are absolutely accurate. What we're looking at here is a pattern, and the, the idea of this uh, pattern is to show us how ventilation perfusion, how the ventilation perfusion ratio determines regional gas exchange. First of all, look at the volume of the slice. It's much less at the top of the lung, or rather less at the top of the lung than the bottom. That's just because of the shape of the lung. And now look at the ventilation, and you can see that it increases substantially between the top and bottom of the lung. 0.24 liters a minute at the top here, 0.82 liters a minute at the bottom. But the blood flow is much more uneven, only 0.07 at the top of the lung and 1.29 at the bottom. And therefore, the ventilation perfusion ratio is high at the top of the lung, over 3, and low at the bottom of the lung, about 0.63. And it's this difference in the ventilation perfusion ratio that determines all the other numbers on the slide. For example, because the ventilation perfusion ratio is high, the PO2 is high at the top of the lung, over 130. Whereas at the bottom of the lung, it's only about 89. So quite big differences in PO2. PCO2 also shows substantial differences. PCO2 at the top, about 28. At the bottom, about 42. Big differences. There are differences in PN2, which we don't need to go into, but they're basically by default. All the, all the partial pressures have to add up to 760 minus 47, the total dry, uh, dry gas pressure in the, in the alveolar gas. So that's why the PN2 changes. Look at the oxygen concentrations of the blood draining from different parts of the lung. The oxygen concentration will be higher at the apex because the PO2 is higher, 132, and will be low at the bottom of the lung. Uh, re it, it, reversely, the, PC, the, the CO2 concentration is less at the top of the lung than the bottom. That's the CO2 concentration in the effluent blood. Particularly interesting are the differences in pH. Much higher pH, 7.51 at the top than the bottom. Why? Because the PCO2 is lower at the top of the lung and the base excess is no different between the top and bottom, so that gives us a high PCO2 at the top. Look how little oxygen is taken up by the apex of the lung under normal conditions. This is partly the fact that the oxygen concentration of the blood uh, is, uh, is high, in other words, the arterial venous difference for oxygen is less, and also because the blood flow is so low, and also there's a difference in the output of CO2 between the top and bottom of the lung. So these are big regional differences in gas exchange, and they have some clinical implications, and I'll just look at a couple of them briefly. It turns out that this high PO2 at the top of the lung affects the distribution of pulmonary tuberculosis. In the adult, pulmonary tuberculosis is much more common at the apex of the lung. Why? Because the tubercle bacillus thrives better in a PO2 of 130 than it does in a PO2 of 89. So it, it grows 
tends to grow at the top of the lung. Very often, the, uh, in adult pulmonary tuberculosis, the, the disease is seen at the apex of the lung. And incidentally, uh, let me show you a, um, a little bit of light relief here. A Swiss pathologist a number of years ago looked at the distribution of pulmonary tuberculosis in bats and showed that apparently that was more common at the base of the lung. That's called the bats spend most of their time hanging upside down. I've never seen those uh, that uh, reproduced, but uh, confirmed, but uh, it's a very colorful indication. Let's go to the pH now. We saw the pH is higher, much higher at the top of the lung than the bottom. And apparently that has an influence on disease as well. Here we have uh, a, a, a lung sections from a patient who died with a very unusual condition uh, called uh, metastatic calcification of the lung. It's, it's very rare. Uh, it's a patient actually with severe leukemia with bone destruction. But what's interesting is that the bone is laid down in the apices of the lungs. And presumably that is related to the high pH there. So these regional differences in gas exchange have some clinical implications. And they're, of course, of interest from a physiological point of view. But that's not the reason why ventilation perfusion inequality is such an important issue. The reason why it's so important is that it determines the overall gas exchange of a gas, the efficiency of gas exchange, the transfer of a gas by the lung. And we can get some notion of this by looking at this simple uh, image again. You remember that the PO2 at the top of the lung is very high, about 132. At the bottom of the lung, it's much less, about 89. Now it turns out, as we know, that the blood flow at the bottom of the lung is much greater than the blood flow the, to the top. And the artist in this uh, particular image has indicated that the, uh, indicated the blood flow by the, the width of the red line here and the, and the ventilation by the width of the airway here. So the blood flow is much less at the top of the lung than the bottom and the ventilation is somewhat less at the top than the bottom. So we can see that the lion's share of the blood draining from the lung is coming from this poorly oxygenated region, okay? Much more blood flow is coming from these lung units with a PO2 of 89 than is coming from the units with a PO2 of 132. So this inevitably means a depression in the PO2 of the effluent blood, which of course becomes the arterial blood. By contrast, the expired alveolar gas is not so dominated by the base of the lung. It's true that there is more ventilation to the base than the apex, but the difference is nothing like as much as it is for blood flow. And the inevitable result is that the PO2 of the mixed expired alveolar gas is higher than the PO2 of the effluent blood. And that really is the crux of ventilation perfusion inequality. It's as if ventilation perfusion inequality is a barrier to gas exchange. Now, be careful when we talk about barrier, we don't mean a mechanical barrier like the thickened blood gas barrier that we see in interstitial lung disease, lung fibrosis, where you get diffusion limitation. No, we're not talking about that kind of barrier at all. We're talking about a barrier, an as if barrier, the result uh, resulting from the fact that the poorly, that the units with a low ventilation perfusion ratio contribute more blood than the units with a high ventilation perfusion ratio, and the inevitable result is interference with gas exchange. And I should emphasize that this not only affects oxygen, which is shown here, but it affects carbon dioxide and affects all the other gases that someone happens to be breathing. For example, during an anesthetic, if you're breathing nitrous oxide, ventilation perfusion inequality will interfere with the efficiency of the lung in taking up nitrous oxide. The CO2 you can see here, the CO2 at the top of the lung, you remember, is low, the PCO2 is low, PCO2 at the bottom of the lung is high, and therefore the effluent blood is going to have a higher PCO2 
than it normally would. And again, in other words, this is like a barrier to gas exchange. The lung is less able to eliminate CO2 from the blood, which is what it's there for, uh, it's, and it's less efficient because of this ventilation perfusion inequality. Now there's a second reason why ventilation perfusion inequality causes hypoxemia. And I must just show you that here. Here we've got a, a simple model where you've got three lung units. In the center you've got a lung unit with a normal ventilation perfusion ratio, which is about one. Remember we talked about that way back uh, when we were talking about the total blood flow and total alveolar ventilation. Normal ventilation perfusion ratio, about one. We've got a unit with a very low ventilation perfusion ratio, 1 over 10, and a unit with a very high ventilation perfusion ratio, 10 over 1. Let's look at the oxygen concentrations of the blood draining from these three lung units. Well, the normal unit has a concentration, under the conditions we've shown here, of about 19.5 mils per deciliter. The unit with a very low ventilation perfusion ratio, of course, has a very low PO2. Actually, it'll be very close to mixed venous blood. And therefore, the composition, the, the blood draining from this unit, has, a PO, has an oxygen concentration of only 16. Okay, 16 mils per 100 mils coming from this lung unit. The mixed venous blood, by the way, is shown here as 14.6 mils per deciliter. So the low ventilation perfusion ratio unit puts out blood with a low oxygen concentration. What about the unit with a very high ventilation perfusion ratio? Well, that puts out blood with a slightly higher oxygen concentration than the normal unit, but not much higher, only about 0.5 mils per deciliter. Why is that? Because the normal PO2 is about 100 and the, the, uh, the oxygen saturation is almost complete, 97% or so, when we go up to a high ventilation perfusion ratio, the increase in oxygen saturation can only be 2 or 3%. And therefore, the increase in the oxygen concentration of the blood is not very much higher than that of the normal unit. And so you can see immediately that the high ventilation perfusion ratio units cannot possibly make up for the low ventilation perfusion ratio units. And that's why in the case of oxygen, there, is, uh, there must be hypoxemia in the presence of ventilation perfusion inequality. Th this mechanism that I'm talking about here does not apply to CO2, but, uh, or to, not, to nearly, not, not nearly to the same extent, because it depends on the shape of the oxygen dissociation curve, that difference between the very high VAQ unit and the medium VAQ unit is, has to do with the shape of the oxygen dissociation curve, of course. Uh, CO2 doesn't have this problem, uh, so oxygen has an additional reason why there's hypoxemia, but let me just emphasize again, the transfer of all gases is, is impaired by ventilation perfusion inequality. Now it's possible to measure the distribution of ventilation perfusion ratios in the lung. Now this is done by a complicated technique. Just in passing I should say that it's not using oxygen and CO2 as the gases because th those gases don't have enough information in them to get at the distribution of ventilation perfusion ratios. What we do here is we infuse a cocktail of inert gases of different solubilities and we look at the gas exchange of those. We're not going to go into the details of it. But the upshot is we can get a distribution of ventilation perfusion ratios. And here we see what happens in the normal lung. Now first of all we've got ventilation or blood flow on this axis. The ventilation is the open circles here and the blood flow the closed circles here. And on the horizontal axis, we've got ventilation perfusion ratio on a log scale, okay? So the normal value, about one here, and of course on a log scale, things change pretty fast. Here's 10 here, 0.1 here, and so on. And we've broken the axis here to show a ventilation perfusion ratio of zero, which would be a shunt. In other words, that would be blood flow coming through, going through a unit where there is no gas exchange. And in the normal lung, by this technique, there is no shunt. 
Okay, now the important thing about this image is that all the ventilation and blood flow are clustered around the normal value of about one. And that's what you'd expect in the normal lung. You, you would expect that evolution has provided us with a lung that has good matching of ventilation and blood flow. You may say, oh, well, you've just been talking about these regional differences of gas exchange. Well, they're of minor consequence. I emphasized that at the beginning. The only reason why we show those regional differences is that it's an easy way, in my opinion, of seeing the way in which the ventilation perfusion ratio affects gas exchange because there's a nice pattern in the normal lung. But the, but the normal lung is very efficient for gas exchange, as you can see here. So that's the normal situation where ventilation and blood flow are clustered around the normal value of one. But now let's look what happens in lung disease. And here's an example of a patient with severe emphysema. Now emphysema is a disease, as we'll see in a moment, where you've got breakdown of the alveolar walls. And let me show you the, the, kind of pat, the kind of pathology you get in emphysema. First of all, here's a normal lung. This is actually a slice, a thin slice of a normal lung mounted actually on a piece of paper. And it's a very nice way of seeing the, uh, the nice uniform appearance of the normal lung. Now let's look at a uh, the lung of a patient with severe emphysema. Looks terrible, doesn't it? Uh, it's a sort of moth-eaten appearance. What you've got is breakdown of the alveolar walls. You've got these large areas, particularly near the apex of the lung, often occurs with emphysema, particularly near the apex of the lung, where the lung tissue has been destroyed. And of course, the capillaries have been destroyed in this region. This region may still be ventilating to some extent, but uh, of course, the ratio of ventilation to, to to blood flow will be very high because the capillaries are destroyed, there's no blood flow. And you can see uh, uh, destruction throughout the lung. So it's not particularly surprising then, when we go to this image again that we saw before, that first of all, the distribution of ventilation perfusion ratios is grossly abnormal. And, and secondly, I think we can get a, a reasonable explanation of why the pattern is what it is. First of all, notice that there is a mode of ventilation perfusion ratios not far from the normal value of one. This mode here is not very far from one. But there's another mode of ventilation perfusion ratios very high, over 10 or so. So these areas have a very high ventilation, but a very low blood flow, and therefore a high ventilation perfusion ratio. And I suppose that it's a reasonable a suggestion that these are the units in the destroyed regions of the lung where the capillaries have been ablated, the capillaries have gone because the alveolar walls have been broken down and of course the capillaries are in the alveolar walls, the alveolar walls have been broken down but those regions are still ventilated and that's the reason why we get this mode with a very high ventilation perfusion ratio. Of course, this lung is very inefficient at gas exchange. Uh, it's, uh, and, and with a high ventilation perfusion ratio, it turns out uh, that it particularly affects carbon dioxide. It doesn't affect oxygen quite so much because there's not a region with a very low ventilation perfusion ratio. Incidentally, there's a very small shunt here, but it's hardly worth mentioning, less than 1% of blood flow going through unventilated alveoli. Okay, so that's the distribution, a typical distribution in emphysema. Let's look at another disease, and that is chronic bronchitis. And incidentally, both chronic bronchitis and emphysema are part of the pattern that we call chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. It includes both of these diseases. And now you can see, again, a very abnormal distribution. You've got one mode here near the normal value of one, Okay, but now you've got a big mode, a large amount of blood flow, going to lung units with a very low ventilation perfusion ratio. And as you might expect, this lung is going to be uh, particularly likely to cause hypoxemia because you've got a lo lot of blood flow going to poorly ventilated units, a low ventilation perfusion ratio. Well, why do we have this mode? Well, I think a very reasonable explanation is that these are lung units behind diseased airways. 
chronic bronchitis is a disease of the airways where you get inflammation of the airways, you get thickening of the airway wall, you get retained secretions, and you interfere with the ventilation of regions of the lung. And presumably what we're seeing here is those lung units behind particularly abnormal airways, partially obstructed airways, and that's giving us this region of low ventilation perfusion ratios. Actually in passing, one of the most surprising things is that this patient had no shunt. In other words, although many of the lung regions, many of the gas exchanger regions are behind very poorly ventilated areas, apparently every region is able to get some ventilation. That was a big surprise to us when we found that. Uh, but uh, that comes up uh, frequently. Sometimes there is a little bit of shunt, but in general, these patients do not have much shunt. And just in passing, probably the, the ventilation that gets to these lung units is not going through the normal airways, but is going between our VLI or between small airways. It's a different kind of what we call collateral ventilation is probably responsible for the ventilation there. Okay, so that's the distribution in chronic bronchitis. Now I want to move to a very important topic, and that is the concept of the stages of impairment of gas exchange with ventilation perfusion inequality. Let's suppose that we start with a normal lung, and by normal here I mean a lung with no ventilation perfusion inequality, essentially our lungs we have almost no ventilation perfusion inequality. Okay, so that's the normal situation. And now suppose that in some magical way we introduce uneven ventilation and blood flow. Uh, it doesn't matter how we do it. One way you could do it actually is to put this normal subject in a high performance aircraft, fighter aircraft, and go through a, a very uh, steep turn and introduce a high G, a high gravitational field, that's going to interfere with the distribution of ventilation and blood flow. We know that. But it doesn't matter how we do it. The point is, suppose, and this is just conceptual, we suddenly introduce uneven ventilation and blood flow. What happens? Well, immediately the lung becomes inefficient at gas exchange. And therefore, the oxygen consumption will fall, the amount of oxygen being transferred by the lung will fall, the amount of CO2 being transferred by the lung will fall, the arterial PO2 will fall, and the arterial PCO2 will rise. All those things will happen if we suddenly mismatch ventilation of blood flow. But of course this is not a steady state solution because the lung has to provide the oxygen consumption demanded by the tissues. The lung doesn't determine how much oxygen we take in. The amount of oxygen we take in is determined by the metabolism of the peripheral tissues. The same is true of carbon dioxide. So this situation is, is a transient situation which cannot possibly last. So there's got to be some kind of change that brings the, C the oxygen consumption and the CO2 production back to normal. And the way this is done is by a further fall in the PO2 in the arterial blood and a further rise in the PCO2. And it's as if uh, by, by reducing the PO2 in the arterial blood, you can think of that as increasing the gradient between the inspired air and the blood. So that in spite of the additional inefficiency of gas exchange, we are able to maintain the a viable oxygen consumption and CO2 output. Th those outputs have to be normal uh, if the organism, if the patient is going to stay alive. But this is done at the, uh, 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 w with a fall in PO2 and an increase in PCO2. Okay? So, the, so this is a, a reasonable steady state solution to what happens when we impose ventilation perfusion inequality on a lung. Normal oxygen consumption, normal CO2 output, but reduced arterial PO2 and increased arterial PCO2. But normally patients, lungs, don't allow that situation to be maintained for any length of time. And the reason is that the body is extremely, quotes, reluctant 
to allow the PCO2 to rise. Why is that? Probably because an increase in PCO2 alters the acid-base balance of the body. And there are many enzymes in the body, the function of which is very dependent on the prevailing pH. So the body is, is very jealous, if you like, quotes, jealous of maintaining the PCO2. And so a common consequence is that at this stage you get an increase in ventilation to the alveoli. And the increase in ventilation to the alveoli brings the PCO2 back to normal. Of course, the oxygen consumption and CO2 production are still normal. They have to be. But the increase in ventilation brings the PCO2 back to normal. However, the PO2 can never return to normal. Why not? Because of the mechanism I showed you earlier. The, the, you remember that you've got these three lung units, and if we look into it, there's no way that an increase in ventilation can bring the PO2 of the arterial blood up to normal. For example, we could double the, the alveolar ventilation, uh, increase it threefold, but we would still have lung units with very low ventilation perfusion ratios, and they will still depress the arterial PO2. So there's no way by increasing the ventilation to the alveoli in, this disease, in these diseased lungs that we can bring the PO2 back to normal. So a very common situation that we find in patients with COPD, chronic, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, is shown here. Of course, they have a normal oxygen consumption or normal CO2 production because that's what the peripheral tissues demand. They have a normal PCO2 because they've increased the amount of ventilation of the alveoli, uh, but they've got a, a low PO2, and that's a very common situation. Incidentally, that situation has led many people to argue that ventilation perfusion inequality does not affect CO2 transfer, but that's a serious misconception. It does interfere with CO2 transfer, but you can bring the PCO2 back to the normal value by increasing the amount of ventilation going to the alveoli. Now sometimes patients like this revert to stage two. Why do they do that? Because in order to maintain a normal PCO2 in the presence of ventilation perfusion inequality, which as we've said many times now, affects the, inefficiency, affects the efficiency of gas exchange, in order to maintain this PCO2, you have to increase the ventilation of the alveoli so much that these patients become extremely short of breath, dyspneic as we say, and it's a very unpleasant situation. So these patients uh, are, are very disabled, are, are very much affected by this increase in ventilation. They have a large work of breathing, which we haven't talked about yet, but we will. Uh, their work of breathing is high and, and maintaining, mounting this high amount of ventilation of their alveoli is extremely unpleasant to the patient. So you can argue that they trade. They trade an increased PCO2 for the advantage of decreasing the, the, uh, the increased ventilation, the, the uh, very unpleasant sense of dyspnea shortness of breath from increasing the ventilation. So some patients may have gone to stage three, but they revert back to stage two, and they allow their PCO2 to rise. Those patients tend to have a poor prognosis. The outlook for these patients is not good. In fact, often we refer to this situation with an increased PCO2 as respiratory failure. Uh, it's not a particularly good term. It's often used though. The respiratory failure referring to the fact that the PCO2 is beginning to rise. Of course, the lung has failed long before that. Uh, the whole business here of ventilation perfusion inequality can be regarded as a failure of normal gas exchange, but that's what's sometimes uh, referred to. Now, sometimes these patients who have ventilation perfusion inequality and a raised PCO2, they're sometimes said to be hypoventilating. That is a misconception. The, you remember we talked about hypoventilation in the last uh, session where we referred to the fact that if you do hypoventilate, the PCO2 has to rise. But these patients don't have an increased PCO2 because they're hypoventilating. In fact, 
Most of them are moving much more air into their alveoli than normal subjects. The cause of the increased PCO2 here is ventilation perfusion inequality. Now it's true that you can reduce the PCO2 by ventilating the patient mechanically, uh, uh, attaching him to a, uh, a mechanical ventilator, and that's often done. But that shouldn't uh, confuse the issue. The, pro the, the reason why they have an increased PCO2 is not that they're hypoventilating. The reason is that they have ventilation perfusion inequality. Now, how can we measure the amount of ventilation perfusion inequality in lung disease? Now, I showed you those very elegant pictures, those very elegant plots of ventilation and blood flow against ventilation perfusion ratio, but that's such a complicated technique that there's no way that can be done in normal clinical practice. It, it's a technique which is reserved for the research laboratory. But there is a way that's commonly used, and I should describe it briefly now. We can do this by using the alveolar gas equation. And let me show you an example of that. So the question is, how can we assess the amount of ventilation perfusion inequality in lung disease? Because we often want to do that. We often want, as we're, as we're managing, as we're treating a patient with COPD, for example, we would like to know what happens to the uh, state of the lung, the degree of ventilation perfusion inequality. And so suppose we have a patient with an arterial PO2 of 50 millimeters mercury and a PCO2 of 60 millimeters mercury. Is there ventilation perfusion inequality or is this patient raised the PCO2 just by hypoventilation? And to answer this, we use the alveolar gas equation and that's shown on the last slide here. So what we're going to use is the the alveolar gas equation that we've now talked about several times this says the alveolar PO2 is equal to the inspired value minus the PCO2 divided by the respiratory exchange ratio plus a constant that we're now going to ignore. It's a small correction factor with the patient breathing air. Now what are we going to use for the alveolar PCO2? You may say there's no such value. We've just shown that 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 changing the ventilation perfusion ratio changes the alveolar, the PCO2 in any lung unit. Well, what we do is we use what's called the ideal alveolar PCO2. Now that's the PCO2 that the lung would have if it was exchanging gas at the same res respiratory uh, exchange ratio here and it was normal. That's, that's what's called the ideal PCO2. And for that, we use the arterial value. Uh, it's a little bit complicated as the reason why we do that, but it turns out that the arterial value is near the ideal PCO2, and so that's what we use. So we're going to plug in now the, uh, the arterial PCO2 here that's calculated. So we've got the alveolar PO2 is equal to 149, that's the inspired value because this patient is breathing air at sea level, 149, that you remember is 21% is of 713, minus the PCO2, which we were given, was 60, divided by the normal respiratory exchange ratio, which is 0.8. Sometimes we are able to measure that, but often we just assume something like that in the resting subject. And that gives us an alveolar PO2 of 74, okay? And that is called the, uh, th that's called the ideal alveolar PO2. Again, by analogy with the ideal alveolar PCO2. And that gives us a difference. You remember that the, that the measured arterial PO2 was 50. So that gives us an alveolar arterial difference of 74 minus, 20, minus 50, which comes out to be 24. Now that's abnormally high. In a, in a young normal subject, the uh, alveolar arterial difference is certainly less than, is usually less than 10. And as you get older, it gets a bit, uh, it, gets, it increases somewhat. But in a patient like this, 24 is certainly abnormal. So we can say quite definitely, this patient has ventilation perfusion inequality. And furthermore, we can follow the degree of inequality by measuring the alveolar arterial oxygen difference. We can follow that through the course of his disease by measuring the uh, arterial PO2 and PCO2 and calculating the alveolar arterial difference shown here.
So this has been a difficult topic. There's no question about this, but it's very important because, as I said right at the beginning, this is the commonest cause of impaired gas exchange in lung disease. Uh, it's the most difficult to understand, and there are a number of misconceptions about it. And so let's just summarize some of the main points we've said. We made the point that the gas exchange in any region of the lung is determined by the ventilation perfusion ratio. And we showed that we could look at three lung units with very different ventilation perfusion ratios, a normal ratio, a ratio of zero, a ratio of infinitely high, and remember we drew a ventilation perfusion ratio line which depicted all possible gas exchange uh, results, all, all possible levels of gas exchange in the lung units uh, in a lung with a normal mixed venous blood and a normal inspired gas. We then transferred that, you remember, to the oxygen carbon dioxide diagram. We then looked at the distribution of ventilation perfusion ratios in the normal upright human lung, not because that's important from a clinical point of view, but simply because it helps us understand how the ventilation perfusion ratio determines gas exchange. And we saw that in the normal upright human lung, the PO2 is high at the top of the lung because the ventilation perfusion ratio is high. And just in passing, we refer to the fact that somebody said that in bats, the PO2 occurs at the base of the lung because they're upside down. We know that in the normal upright human lung, or normal patient, the, the, the pulmonary tuberculosis particularly occurs at the apex because the PO2 is high. And we also referred to a very unusual condition, calcification of the lung, which occurs at the apex, presumably because the pH there is very high, because the PCO2 is low. We then uh, looked at the reason why ventilation perfusion inequality impairs gas exchange. And first we used this very simple model with a high PO2 in the apical units, a low PO2 in the low units, and pointed out that the that most of the blood flow comes from the lower part of the lung, and therefore this must depress the PO2 in the arterial blood. And this must give us a difference between alveolar gas and effluent blood. It's, in other words, ventilation perfusion ratio inequality is like a barrier to gas exchange. Furthermore, it affects all gases. It affects carbon dioxide and any other gas we happen to be using. We also pointed out that there's a special problem for oxygen because if you look at units with a very low ventilation perfusion ratio, they, they're putting out blood with such a low oxygen concentration that you can't possibly make it up with units from a very high ventilation perfusion ratio. We then looked briefly at distributions in a patient with emphysema and in chronic bronchitis and we could we could explain the reasons why in ventilation perfusion ratio there's a mode of high ventilation perfusion ratios presumably because of ventilation to very poorly perfused lung which has been in areas destroyed by emphysema and in the patient with chronic bronchitis there's a mode of low ventilation perfusion ratios presumably because those lung units are behind very diseased airways where the ventilation is very low. We then uh, talked about misconceptions about ventilation perfusion inequality. We looked at the different stages of a conceptual stages of a patient with impaired, uh, um, with, with ventilation inequality, impaired gas exchange. And by the way, of course, those are conceptual stages. We like to think of a patient going through those stages, but we can't identify those in any particular instant. But, we can, but it's helpful to look at those stages. And we pointed out that many patients with undoubted ventilation perfusion inequality have a low PO2, but a, a normal arterial PCO2. And that some people have argued from that that ventilation perfusion inequality does not affect CO2 transfer, but that is a misconception. And finally, we looked at the ways in which we can measure ventilation perfusion inequality in disease. We can't use the complicated, what's called multiple inert gas elimination technique uh, that gave us those nice uh, 
distributions that we saw, but we use the alveolar arterial oxygen difference, which we calculate from the alveolar gas equation using the arterial PCO2 as what we call the ideal value. Don't worry too much about the details if you like, but the, the, the determination of the alveolar arterial oxygen difference is very important. So that's the end of our series on pulmonary gas exchange. Very important topic, of course, the crux of the function of the lung. And uh, next time we're going to be talking about mechanics. So bye for now.